Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you came across this message. The sermon you are about to watch is from our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Gospel of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Amen. You may be seated. How's everybody today? Have you ever like just loved to do something and couldn't wait to do it? That's where I am right now. <laughs> I am so excited to be with you guys today. I feel the weight of responsibility to teach you uh, what I will here out of Mark chapter 7. At the same time, I'm super excited to be able to do it. And so I'm glad that you're here. I know you may not be as excited as I am, but I'm excited. And I hope you are too. My name's Tom. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope. And we're currently teaching straight through the book of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 7, verses 14 through 23 today. So I encourage you right now, turn in the, the actual Bible that you have or on your app. We're going to have it on the screen as well. But I, I encourage you today to follow along as we look at these verses. Uh, chapter 7, the book of Mark, verses 14 through 23. All right, you ready to go? All right, here we, here we go. In our language and culture, we talk a lot about the word heart. I'm not referring to the beating organ inside our chest either. That's not the heart I'm talking about. I mean what makes us us, what makes me me, what makes you you. Our desires, our leanings, our attitudes, our appetites for life. When we say things like, she has an amazing heart, look at how much she cares for, other, or, 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 for others, or wow, what heart he just showed in winning whatever competition that he was in. When we say these things about the heart, what we're referring to is that inner drive, that inner desire, that inner attitude that a person displays in how they live. Today, what we're going to see, and I think this is very important to understand, is what God has to say about our heart. Like, listen, we can, we can talk about that beating thing. We can talk about who we are and our attitudes and, and our actions and, and what that looks like as far as our lives are concerned. But really what we need to know is what does God say about our heart and how that pertains to our spiritual lives. If you were here last week and if you weren't, I encourage you to go online and watch Pastor Ricky's message out of the first uh, excuse me, out of the verses um, that he preached out of the first of Mark chapter 7. But he talked about the reality and dangers of being a spiritual hypocrite. Do you guys remember that? Hypocrites, though, there's one thing that characterizes them like nothing else. Hypocrites usually, not usually all the time, place little to no importance on the seriousness of God's word. You know why they act like they act and they do what they do is because they know, they, 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 well, they may know what the Bible says, but they don't really care about that. That's why hypocrites either add to it or take from it. They say one thing, they do another. And you say, Tom, when we studied last week, like, why would they do this? What would be that motivation? Were they willfully not following God? Were they intentionally rebellious toward God? Well, maybe some were, some were actually doing that, but the truth is, I think the average Jewish person from that day just wanted to follow God. And what they wanted was they actually expected their leaders to lead them well, but sadly, that was not what was happening, and that's what we saw in what Pastor Ricky taught. So this week, Jesus is standing there. He's, asked, he's, a, he's already answered some questions that they had or, some, or addressed some statements that they made. And this week, he's going to turn around and he's going to talk to some other people. Let's look at Mark chapter 7 and just pick up there. Verse 14, the Bible says, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parables. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, 
What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within and they defile a person. Today I want to give us our sermon in a sentence, if you will. It's very succinct. My heart is defiled from the inside out. Nothing on the outside can defile me more than I already am. My heart, your heart, our hearts are defiled from the inside out. And nothing on the outside can defile me more than I already am. So you'll know what today is going to look like. I just want to briefly tell you, I'm going to methodically walk us through this passage verse by verse. And then at the end, I'll give us a few application statements to see how this passage applies to our lives, okay? So it may not be exactly how we usually do it, but hey, I'm doing my own thing because I'm excited to be here and I'm in, front of the, I'm in front of this, amen? All right, no applause needed, but thank you. For, a, for some more context, I wanna give you as we start today, if you remember from last week when Ricky taught, the Jewish leaders had arrived near Jerusalem and their complaint against Jesus was that they're, that, that the disciples were not washing their hands before they ate. You remember that? They began to question Jesus about this, and after he'd listened to them and answered them, he turned again, the Bible tells us here, to the people and completely contradicted what the, late, what the leaders were attempting to teach them. So the leaders are questioning Jesus. Jesus answers their questions and, and says a couple of things to them, and it's like he completely turns his back and he goes, now listen, here's the real deal. He begins to teach the people opposite of what they had been taught. And you know why? Because Jesus wanted them to know, just like he wants us to know what the truth really is, no matter what. The first thing we see in this passage in verses 14 and 15 is this, the origin of defilement. In other words, where does the propensity, my propensity, my desire to sin come from? Where does that come from? What's the origin of the defilement that I have? Look at verse 14. The Bible says, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. Jesus here is calling or summoning the people to himself. Basically, he's saying this. Come to me. I have something to tell you. You see, Jesus desired for the people to know the truth, and he gives them basically two commands. Look at what they are. He says, first, hear me. This word hear means exactly what you think. Like open your ears and take it in. Hear the words that I'm saying. Take in what I'm about to say. But the second thing he says is very interesting. He says, and I want you to understand, understand, not as a, a statement, but as a command. Understand what you are hearing. Now, this word understand, just like many words um, in other languages, there are, we have basically one word for understand. You know what it is? Understand. Three years of seminary, that's what I got. <laughs> but the Greek language, actually, we know had three. This one is not the most common word. This word means to have an intelligent grasp of something, listen, and this is the most important part, that challenges one's thinking and practice. I want to I hang your hat there on that word challenge. Jesus said, I'm about to teach you something. And it's not going to be normal. Like it's going to be opposite of what you've been taught. And it's going to challenge how you think. And when he says it, the Bible tells us, he looked at him and said, all of you, hear and understand. All of you, everyone, everybody, nobody left out. Listen to me. Grasp this upcoming difficult concept. Here's the truth. God always wants us to understand what his truth is, no matter how challenging it is to our former teaching or our culture. I realize that in this room, we were all brought up differently. Maybe, maybe we were from different um, uh, uh, sects of uh, Christianity even, Presbyterian, Methodist, but maybe some of us weren't. Maybe some were brought up Catholic. Maybe some weren't brought up in Christianity at all. You understand when we come to the Bible, what happens is we're going to read it and we're going to go, wait a minute, that's not what I was taught. 
That's not what I've heard. But here's the thing about the scripture. It's either all true or none of it is. What this says about us, it's right. What Jesus was gonna say to them was correct. What his word says is what's right and best for us, amen? So Jesus then tells them what this truth is. Look at verse 15. Like here's the truth, okay? There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. He says nothing outside that by going into, nothing, nada, nine, none, whatever your language background was. In mine, it was nothing without a G. From the outside, something that comes in to us, that by going in, literally coming into the body, he says can. This is the word dunamis, which is usually a, a, a noun, but here it's used as a verb, and it means to have power or ability. Like whatever's on the outside has no power, no ability to go inside you and do what? He tells us to defile. This word defile is not a common word. I've used it several times, and I've failed, and not failed, I've, I've on purpose not told you exactly what it means, but you can imagine, right? Here's what it means, to make impure, to make unclean. You see, Jesus is speaking of spiritual uncleanness and impurity. How do I know that? Because they were concerned about washing of the hands, the impurity, and the uncleanness of the body, and Jesus said, that's not what I'm talking about. This uncleanness I'm talking about is on the inside. That's why he says heart. Nothing is able, can have the power to defile you. Here's another way to say what Jesus said here. There's nothing, excuse me, there's nothing entering into us from the outside that is able to make us worthy of being separated from God. There's nothing going into us that is able to do that. In other words, nothing God has created outside our body can defile us, making us unclean just because we ingested it or took it in in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Nothing. Then he uses one of my favorite words in all the New Testament. It's the word but. It's a conjunction that means whatever's before and whatever's after is completely opposite. Okay? So Jesus said, nothing can defile you. He said, but. Jesus didn't end the discussion here, did he? He said, there is something that defiles you. There is something that defiles all of us, but it's not what's outside that goes in. Listen, our, in our human mind, we always want to blame something else for why we are like we are, amen? I do. Like, I wish I was skinnier. No, hey, I don't need any, you know. I know how it happens. I can't blame anything for my sin. It's that thing I did, that thing I saw, that, that person that was in my life. No. He wants them to know what made them spiritually impure or unclean or tainted. The issue wasn't that they were, that they were not unclean. They were unclean. But they needed to know why they were unclean. And so do we. If it's not something that goes in, then why in the world are we unclean, impure, defiled? Here's what Jesus says. The things that come out of a person are what defile him. This is a, uh, in the Greek language, in, in the grammar, this is a plural participle. And I know you could give a rip about the participle. I get it. I, you know, if, if, if I didn't like English, I wouldn't know what it was either, but it, it's fine. But you know what plural means, right? Multiple. More than one. In other words, this plural here tells us that there are already things, lots of things in us. Not a thing. People say, I sin. Well, what is the sin? Well, there's multiples. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. In fact, he's going to tell us here at the very end. There are lots of things that are already in us. Our actions, our words, our attitudes show us what's inside. My dad used to say, squeeze an orange and you know what you're going to get, right? It's not going to be grape juice. 
You squeeze an orange, what's coming out is gonna be orange juice. What comes out of us when we're stressed or when we're in a pinch or a bind? I'm gonna tell you, it's ugly. It can be hate. It, 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 it can be malice or anger or frustration, for sure, impatience, inconsistency, hateful speech, even vileness. You see, the God of the universe, the Savior of the world, looks at those who were there. And listen, he looks into our hearts today. And here's what he says, and I want you to listen close, okay? Okay. Because I know many in this room deal with this. Nothing you eat, nothing you've learned, no offense that has been done to you, no rejection that you've ever felt, no one's words or actions toward you who've hurt you, none of this makes you spiritually unclean. None of it. We've all been defiled from the moment of our conception. Our human, uh, 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 all of us carry this Blood from our human mother and father. When Adam and Eve fell, we all fell. Yeah, that little baby that you brought home, already messed up. Hadn't even learned anything. That incredibly godly spouse, that wonderful friend, that incredible mentor, the person that you look in the mirror, listen, the person that you're looking at behind this pulpit, we were all defiled. Without Jesus' life, we will remain defiled. So here's, the, here's another truth for us today. The origin of our depravity and defilement comes out of our heart. If you leave with nothing else today, I want you to understand that what's in us isn't right. It isn't good. It isn't holy. Depravity, defilement, whatever word you want to put there, uncleanness, impurity comes from our heart. Now, it's at this point, if you're following along, and you're looking at your Bible, and you have an ESV version, an English standard, or if you have an NLT, New Living Translation, or if you have an NIV, if you went to school at all, maybe if you didn't, you notice there's no verse 16. I don't want to bring something up, but I also don't want to just pass by this, okay? Because if you have an NAS or a KJV or an NKJV, there is a verse 16, and here's what the verse 16 says in, in those versions, of those English versions. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, it's, it's not in every version. In over 900 versions of the English translation, if you will, some have it and some don't. And as you can see, if you have some of those versions, the addition or the, or the absence of this verse that I just read, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear, it, it really doesn't change the theological meaning of the passage. But either way, don't worry about it. I can tell you why it's not there with one sentence, okay? You ready? And this isn't pastor speak, and I'm not trying. Listen, I would love to have a conversation with you after. I just don't want to go into a seminary lesson in this moment. I will answer every question you got. But I can really solve it with one sentence. Put it up on the screen, fellas. If there had been copy machines, you see, the 25,000 different manuscripts that are spread worldwide would have all said the same thing because they would have just made a picture of it. But they didn't. They all had to copy it by hand, and when that happens, you know what happens. I'll discuss it with you later. There were no copy machines. Here's what I do want you to know today, though. You can trust whatever version of the scripture that you have that you're holding in your hand that's an English version. You can trust it. Trust me. If you can't, we'll tell you which one it is. If you've got a question, let us know. We'll help you out with it. Flag me down in the lobby if you want or ask one of the other pastors to explain to us why, in, in more depth why or why, or why not it, it, it's there. All right? I just didn't want to pass by it and ignore it and have people go, wait a minute, pastor. You didn't. Do okay, there you go. Number two. Let's talk about the parable concerning the spiritual defilement. Look at verse 17. The Bible says, And when he, Jesus, had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. So the setting changes as Jesus and the disciples enter a house now. So he was talking, uh, in, in Ricky's passage, he was, he was talking to the, to, to, to the Jewish leaders. Then he turns in the passage that I just started reading, and he talks to the crowd. Now we see a, a third setting where he actually goes into a house with his disciples away from the crowd. And they ask, the disciples do, 
about a parable. But if you're reading along with me in, in, in uh, Mark chapter 7, you'll see there's no parable there. It seems to be absent from the passage. And in fact, there is no parable in the book of Mark in this passage. But in the same narrative in the book of Matthew, we do find the parable. So I want us to read the parable and I want you to understand it. Matthew chapter 15, verse, verses 10 through 14. Well, I'll read them quickly for you. The Bible says, hear and understand. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it's exactly what he said in Mark. He said, if it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. Does that sound familiar? Yes, same exact narrative. This defiles a person. But look at verse 12. Here's where things kind of turn. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered. Every plant, here's the parable, that my heavenly Father is not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind gods. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. The Bible tells us here that the Pharisees were offended by Jesus. And I'm not surprised, and none of us should be. They were angered. They were shocked. And I bet they were. Nobody ever questioned the Pharisees. I mean, they were the smartest of smart. Nobody knew what they knew. The people were taught and believed that the Pharisees were always right. And here Jesus questions them. He, he actually pushes. They were offended. They knew what he was talking about. But when they heard the parable, the disciples had questions. They had questions. Look at verse 13. Every plant that my heavenly Father is not planted will be uprooted, Jesus said. Here we get this glimpse of what will happen to these plants. Their question is basically, what are you talking about? Who are these plants? And what difference does that make in my life? And I need, I need greater teaching. In other words, since God didn't plant them, they will not remain or last. What's going to happen to these plants? They're going to be gone. They're going to be uprooted. These plants were the erroneous teaching of the Pharisees. You want to know why the Pharisees were so upset? Because the teaching that they were being given was wrong. And Jesus points it out and says, listen. My father didn't give this. My father is going to take this up. And then he says, but that's not your responsibility, basically. Because you know what their responsibility would be? Look what he says. Leave them alone. Let them alone. Stay away from them. In other words, don't engage wrong teaching because God will deal with it. Why should we leave them alone? Listen, this, this isn't just a word for the people of that day. This is a word for us. Why should we leave them alone? Because biblical doctrine matters. What this Bible says isn't just good words. Not just good, a good way to pattern your life. These words are literally his words. It's dangerous to the spiritual lives of Jesus followers to follow those who teach extra biblical or erroneous doctrines because these doctrines, he says, are blind guides. Think about that for a second. You want to know how to get somewhere? You want somebody who can get you there, don't you? He said, you're asking for somebody to lead you around who can't get around. This is not good. Wrong doctrines lead others, he says, into pits these pits were dug around the Middle East to catch the water when the water would come so they could keep it. And he said, blind guides will lead you into these pits and you will suffer. In other words, when we follow and believe doctrines that God has not given us and are opposite of what God has said and are led by those who don't know or believe what God has said, we won't be led to or know about God. What was the doctrine they taught? Wash your hands before you eat. God said, hang on, I didn't say that. That doesn't make you godly. Take so many steps to the synagogue, to the services on Sunday morning. Don't work too hard because if you do, you're not like God and God doesn't accept that. That's not what he taught. He said, these are blind gods that lead you into pits. It's good to know what the Bible says and to be led by those who love you can I say this to you? As your pastors, we love you. If you only knew how much we love you, 
We care for you. And the best way we can care for you isn't just to live our lives like we should, but to teach you what he has said, not what we think. We want you to know what God says. Jesus' explanation was a way to say this. Both those leading you and the doctrines that they teach that lead you to believe or do things God doesn't expect of you are to be left alone. When we follow those who aren't ordained by God to lead us spiritually, we're being led into pits, into ditches, into mishaps, and places in life that God hasn't intended for us. The parable that Jesus told them was meant to warn them about those who would keep them following the traditions of men instead of following the commandments of God. And so Jesus goes on further and reveals to them, number three, the, the content of our defiled heart. The content of the defiled heart, of the unclean, of the impure heart. Look at verse 18. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? This word understanding is the exact word that he used in verse 14. In other words, did this challenge you already? Are you still challenged by what's being said? And then he says, do you not see? In the ESV, it says, do you not see? In other versions, I think in the NAS, it actually says, do you not understand? It's like it's, it's there twice. Do you, not under, do, do you understand? Do you not understand? But this word is a different word from the one that was just used three, four words ago. This word is a word that means to comprehend or grasp something on the basis of, listen to this, careful thought. The other one was challenging. Do you understand this is going to be challenging? I want you to understand a challenging truth. This one is, when you hear a challenging truth, a truth, I want you to think about it. I want you to know what it is that you believe. I want you to know what you have commissioned yourself to. I want you to know the one that you're following. Do you not see? Jesus wanted them to think deeply about what he was saying and understand his words. He wasn't simply challenging them. He was saying, I want you to think about this. God doesn't make us follow him. Amen. He wants us to follow him. He said, I'm going to teach you something challenging, but I want you to know why you do what you do. He says that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him. He says it again, just what he said in the previous verses. He restates it. That word whatever means whatever. It means anything. It means everything. You make the list and it's in the list, okay? Whatever that is, nothing will defile you that goes in. Look at verse 19. Since it enters not his heart, this word since, actually I think better translated, and this is just my opinion, but I think it's better translated because. Because whatever goes into the heart he says is expelled, excuse me, but, uh, but that doesn't go into his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. He said, what they're taking in only goes there, and it, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to draw pictures here or anything, but you get it, right? I am so glad, too, that the, the translators did a G version of this, <clears throat> because in the original language, it's two words put together. The first word means to move from one area to another on or in a drain. The second word means a sitting place. Okay, so you got it, right? He said what goes into you doesn't touch your heart, people. It may touch all the other energy you have, but it's not the heart because it's coming out. You may work it out, or it just may come out on its own. (laughs) But it ain't staying in you, and it's not going to hurt you. I've always said that. That's why I like eating everything. (laughs) Look at verse 20. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. He says it again. So what comes out proves what's in. Whatever's coming out, that's what is in us. Look at verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts. And then he begins to list them. And as I started studying these, I noticed that the first six were actually plural nouns, which means extras. So the the ESV actually says sexual immorality, but... It could be translated and maybe should be sexual immoralities because sexual immorality actually is a plural, 
Like, because it, it's multiple things. In fact, as we put them up on the screen here, sexual immorality is any sin outside of marriage. Let that land. Like, we know it and we're afraid to say it these days. Living with somebody that's not your spouse, shacking up is what we used to call it. Being with someone who isn't your mate, fornication before marriage, extramarital affairs during marriage. I don't want to list a thing, but you know them all. Anything except for what the person that you are married to. These are actions that we commit. Sexual immorality, theft, stealing what's not what is what was never yours and maybe never would be. Murder, personally slaughtering or slaying someone out of vengeance. Adultery. I thought it was pretty interesting here that that he separated sexual immorality and adultery because adultery was very specific to have a relationship while married with someone who's not your spouse or even while unmarried with someone who is married. There's adultery that's committed. Coveting, verse 22. Desiring to have more than one's due. It has to do with greediness, an insatiable appetite, if you will, for things. Wickedness. It's a state or condition of having no moral or social values. It's baseness or maliciousness. And then he uses the next six nouns as singular in nature, in number. Maybe these are attitudes. Where the first six were actions, maybe these are attitudes. Here they are, deceit, to take advantage through craft and underhanded methods, cunning or treachery, sensuality, a lack of constraint, insatiable desire for pleasure, envy, love of possessions with the meaning of malice, with stinginess in it, slander, speech that... that, uh, denigrates or defames, reviling, disrespect, pride, is arrogance, an undue sense of one's importance, bordering on insolence, rude or disrespectful behavior, foolishness, a lack of prudence, being unable to plan for the future, having good judgment. Listen, he gave us 12, but there's probably 1,200. He said, that's what's in our heart. You say, Tom, that's not in my heart. That's in your heart too. That's in my heart. That's in every human heart that's ever existed except for Jesus Christ himself who had a different father than us. We all came from Grandma uh, Grandma Eve and Grandpa Adam. Jesus didn't. How did he escape that? He was God of a very God and God in the flesh. We are humans and every one of these describe us. You see, this list of terrible, awful, obviously bad actions and attitudes are not what make us sinners. The heart that produces these things in us is what makes us a sinner. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We are not sinners because, oh, I sin, so I must be a sinner. No, you were a sinner before that. We sin because we're sinners. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah actually agrees with this, and Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, here's what he says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, what ungodly behavior will it not lead us to engage in if we follow our heart? What thought will it not generate? What heinous action does it not desire for us to participate in? Well, I love God. I just don't like what he said in his word. Then you don't, I'm not sure you like him. This is what he says about us. Not because he's proud of it, but because he wants us to know the truth about who we are. I know it's hard. I don't even like looking at the list. So I want to give us some applications. After I've just, I've gone through every verse. Here are the things that I saw immediately. Number one, the defilement Jesus speaks of here is spiritual and not physical. This is purely spiritual. Having good hygiene is a good thing. Washing your hands before you eat and cooking has saved many lives around the world. And God knows we went through COVID, man. They gave us videos on it, like 10 minutes of washing the hands so much that my hands were raw. You know what I'm saying? Like, we know the importance of washing hands. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The defilement here is not of a physical nature. It's of a spiritual one. God has never focused on the outside physical life even close to like he has focused on the inner spiritual life because that's 
who we are. We can wash our bodies and get rid of the dirt and filth, but we can never, listen to me, wash deep and hard enough to get rid of our main problem of, of uncleanness and defilement of heart. You cannot, there is no medicine. There's no amount of showering or bathing or washing or, or, or having perfect hygiene that will ever make you right with God. In other words, it's not everything you do. It's who you are. Number two, God's expectations of us and man's expectation of us are almost always diametrically opposed to one another. Man's expectations are burdensome. God's expectations are Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Look what he says. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is and my burden is. Does that sound like what they were telling the, oh, you didn't wash your hands? Oh, how many steps did you take? Oh, did you use the right word? Did you lift your hands high enough? Did you do all the do's and don't all the don'ts? You see, it's quite simple. Obey God, submit to his light and easy yoke. Are you tired? From all the things you gotta do, I gotta read my Bible, I gotta share my faith, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta give, I gotta go, I gotta serve, I gotta, 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 gotta. And God's going, hang on here. My burden's easy, my, my, my burden's light, my yoke is easy. Number three, in our fallenness, we find it easier to make a rule we can follow rather than to follow the commandments of God. We like to make our own rules, don't we? We like to make them because they're easy for us. We like doing something we already do that costs us nothing. It was easier for the Pharisees to say, wash your hands, because that was something they were already doing. It was much easier for them than it was for them to believe God and follow what he'd said. They may have been sincere in their belief, but sincerity is not obedience. And I want you to hear that today. Sincerity, no matter how sincere you are and whatever faith you have or don't have, trust me, that's not obedience. Stop believing that the good you do or the rules that you create and you keep are making you clean or cleaner. Here's a good one. This one may seem a little bit obtuse, but God gave us pastors to oversee and shepherd our souls. I'm a gift. <laughs> You're welcome. I know my wife thinks I'm a gift. Praise God. Sometimes I don't even feel like a gift. But the Bible says he gave us pastors to oversee us here. Like the implication out of Matthew chapter 15. How weird would it be if today after the service I, I went to my neighborhood, but instead of pulling in my driveway, I pulled in the driveway of my next door neighbor. I went in their house, pet their dog, put on their slippers, sat in their recliner, and ate out of their pantry. You know what that is? Weird. <laughs> you know why? That's not my family. My family's next door. If hope's your family, why are you listening to everybody else? I know there's some good podcasts out there, and I venture a few myself, but here's what I know. What God wants me to learn and know comes from this place in my small group, from this pulpit. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to try to get you just all here. I mean, I kind of am. Because this is where you serve and give your gifts. Maybe you just don't see us as family. This principle, though, applies to our spiritual family. God has blessed us with leaders who work hard at providing for us by teaching God's word and protecting us from the enemy. And can I be honest with you, and so hopefully you still like me after this. Sometimes we listen to other people. God hasn't given authority to look over our souls. He has given us authority. We take this responsibility seriously too. And I just want to say this from a pastor who loves you. It's very, very dangerous for you to do that. Not everybody who says Jesus knows the right thing. And they ain't preaching from the Bible. Not all who say they know God do. We cannot protect you from something we don't know you're in. I say that because I love you. 
Number five, no one's heart's originally clean. This is one that I, I put in last, and it wasn't last on the list, but as I started thinking through this week of, of what this looks like, there, there's a part of us that says, you know what? Man, what a good heart I have. What a good heart that person has. Man, I, listen, I'm not sure that they, I've always been saved. No, you haven't. You've always been defiled. No one's heart is originally clean. The Pharisees and the way they said you got to do this and that and do, do all the do's and don't all the don'ts made it seem like there was. And there are lots of people around the world who are still trying to believe that and, and work their salvation out. And God said, no, your heart's dirty and I'm going to clean it up. Number six, we cannot and did not defile ourselves because we didn't. We also likewise cannot make ourselves clean. I'll get myself cleaned up and then I'll come to God. No, you won't. You can't clean yourself up. Only God can make what's unclean clean. Number seven, we need to know the truth about defilement to be saved. No one ever came to God without realizing the need they have for Jesus, for God himself. Every human needs God. And because today you've been exposed to the truth, God is inviting you. If you're within earshot of my voice, he's inviting you to know him too. Romans 10, 13 says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How much easier does that get, Scott? For everybody who'll just ask me, I will do it. Number eight and last. Being defiled from conception does not justify why we should seek to live a practically holy life. I've talked a lot about defilement. I've talked a lot about how impure and unholy. So some people would say, well, I might as well just go ahead and live like I want. I mean, I might as well just live like hell, I guess, because that's what, you know, it's already as bad as it's going to get. That is not the attitude of a Christian. That may be the attitude of somebody who doesn't believe in God, but that is not the attitude that a Christian has. Since we have every potential to live as sinful as we want, as we want to, we don't have to as Christians. That's the difference. Nor should that be our desire. God said, be holy for I'm holy. And basically he's saying, if you want to be like me, this is what I'm like. Do this. Like, try. Like, be as holy as you can. Don't try to make other people holy with you. You just come to that fork in the road of sin and choose not sin over sin. Live a practically holy life. You know, history tells us from, from and during the Middle Ages until this very moment, people have tried to figure out ways to get rid of, or in many cases, away from their sin. Among them were people known as hermits, monastics, anchorites, and ascetics, and maybe you've never heard of them, but I know you've heard of these next people, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians. They all wanted to solve the problem of sin infecting, affecting, influencing, and entering into them. Some, in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries in Germany, there would be some monks who would literally brick themselves up into walls with 12 inch by 12 inch holes where people could feed them and where they could take out their excrement. You know why? Because they said they wanted to get away from sin. There was a man called Simeon the uh, Stylite. You know what he did? He lived on a 50-foot pole on top of a 12-foot by 12-foot platform because he wanted to get away from sin and from those who sinned. And the same thing, they would, they would had a pulley system to get food up to him and to take down the excrement. I don't know if they used the same buckets or not. Probably not, they were, but anyway. You know why? Because he wanted to get away from it. But you know what the problem was? They might get away from people who sin. And they might get away from all the things they think sin is. But they could not get away from themselves. As I sit here today, as I stand here and I preach and I beg, I want you to know Jesus is the only one who can clean that up. Let me show you the sermon in a sentence one more time so you can just feel this. My heart is defiled from the inside out. Nothing on the outside can defile me more than I already am. That's true. But you know what? Nobody can clean it up like Jesus. For those of you who are believers today, 
Have you been trying to repair yourself, fix yourself? You've been trying to clean up yourself? He said, if you ask, Ricky led us in prayer this morning. If we will confess our sins, he is just and righteous to forgive it. Just ask. If you're not a believer today, I want you to know that what's already in you has defiled you. I was there at one time. God saved my soul, 1980. I've never been the same. What he did for me that day, I could never do for myself. And you know what? It was in a service just like this where the pastor said, if you need God today, you can have him. He wants to clean you up. I was 11, so I don't know how much cleaning there was. But according to scripture, all 12 of those things existed in me, whether I knew it or not. The man I am today knows that all those things are true. But Jesus will clean you up too. So here's what we're about to do. I'm going to give us a couple of instructions. If, if you don't know the Lord today, I want you to be saved. You don't have to do it here, but, but here's what I would say. If you would come down and ask somebody, we want to lead you to him, and we want to show you what it looks like to give your life to Jesus. For those of you who are believers, please don't leave today until everything's finished. I know it's... Anyway, stay where you are to pray, to ask God to move in the hearts of these women and men and boys and girls in this room who need Jesus today. We are defiled, but we got the person that can clean it all up. Amen? Let's pray together and the pastors come. Lord, thank you for your grace today. Lord, we prayed this morning as pastors, but we just want your presence, Lord. We want you to move. Lord, we can preach a perfect sermon, which I don't know if that happened. I know I read a perfect word from you. But God, without your movement, we're just here. So Lord, what I pray in this moment is somebody looked at themselves for the very first time and said, I need Jesus, that they'd have the courage just to tell somebody. Maybe they'd have the courage to come down here and say, can you help me to know Jesus? We'll lead you to him and your life will never be the same. God, you're good to us. You're holy, you're true. We believe you and we trust you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing. Those of you who are believers, stay and pray. Those who need Jesus, please come tell us today. We'd love to lead you.